That was a bumper bumper. Um, how y'all doing, saints? And some saints. I mean, some, there's some saints in here. But how saints and saints? How are you? I hear 17 people. I said, how are you? There we go. There, ooh, and you stopped on time. Y'all are quiet here. I appreciate it. Um, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'm thankful to be here. I always enjoy uh, being able to communicate about God and his word. Um, it's, it's, it's awkward and it's fun all at the same time. Um, and so I'm glad that you are here to join me. Today we're going to talk about leaving a legacy of learning. Uh, this is super relevant seeing that we all need to know something to communicate something. Um, especially, oh, my earring. I'm, I'm, I'm just not going to be able to be cute today, but it's okay. Um, my hair covers it up, so it's cool. Um, I, I think uh, considering Twitter and social media and all of these things that we have access to, we see so much information being brought forth. And so I think learning what it means to learn is necessary. Um, let me pray first. Let me pray. God, I, I thank you for um, this moment, uh, the moment to speak with you. Um, that's kind of serious that we have access to God now without any lambs to slaughter, without having to travel to a temple. We just can speak with you wherever because Jesus already tore that veil. And so I'm thankful that prayer uh, is a big deal. Um, I pray that you would meet us here, that you would teach us all that you want us to know, that you would help us apply all that we learn, that you would bring to our hearts and our minds things that we need to repent of, whether that's arrogance in our learning or apathy in our lack of. And so I pray, God, that you would speak. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was growing up, um, I asked a lot of questions. To the point that when I graduated kindergarten, they gave out these uh, superlatives for the little five and six year olds. And my superlative was most inquisitive. Um, I don't know what questions I was asking, but I'm sure I even asked what most inquisitive even meant. Why would you give such a long word to a, a five year old? Um, at home, I asked questions of my mother all of the time to the point that she, um, put in place like a, a inquisitive curfew. And so, <laughs> I'm about to start doing that to my kids. But she, I just remember the moment she had came home from work and I was sitting on the bed. I don't know, I was probably asking her about, you know, why she was tired, something like that. And she said, Jackie, um, after nine, that's how my mom talked, after nine, no more questions, okay? <laughs> The funny thing is, is that my oldest daughter, Eden, who is four years old, is the same way. Ain't God funny? <laughs> it's, it's beautiful and it's irky all at the same time. Because Eden will ask me questions or she'll drill the question down to an unanswerable degree. What I mean by that is, so we was in the car one time driving. She looks out the window. She was maybe two and a half, three. And she said, Mommy, um, what are clouds? No, she said, are those clouds? I said, yes. She said, what are clouds? I said, because I didn't, I didn't pay attention to school. I said, uh, <laughs> big, fluffy, white bubbles of water. That's, that's the best I could do. <laughs> she said, why are they up there? I said, I guess to, to give us rain and some shade when we need it. She said, why are they white? I said, I don't, I don't know. I think that's just what God wanted because I always default to God when I get confused. <laughs> I just, that's what God, he, he wants his glory some kind of way. And he wanted them to be white. She was like, why did God want them white? I said, Eden Grace, I, I don't, I don't know. She said, mommy, you do know. <laughs> I think being inquisitive is connected to simply being a learner. Um, learning is what all human beings do because God has given us all a brain that is constantly exposed to new things, new people, new ideas, new smells. So we're always having to learn something. It's a part of our humanity. It's a part of the limited nature of what we're able to actually contain or retain. In Christ, though, Learning becomes so much more meaningful because learning is then attached to glory. Where we fill our minds with all that we can know about God. 
allowing it to be renewed and what it believes about him and everything else. And then we end up going out into the world with this new mind that God has transformed and God is changing. And in this new world, we then find that there is always something coming against this knowledge of God that is worth learning so that it can be exposed, such as racism, certain political policies, sexual orientation, mass incarceration, implicit bias. These are really big ideas that have really tangible consequences. To understand or learn about them is to equip us in how to be Christians who are informed from a Christian worldview. God does not want ignorant saints. Even the concept of discipleship is rooted in learning. To be a disciple is to be a student, literally. So in Matthew 28, when God tells us to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you, Jesus is basically saying, go get you some students and teach them what I said. To teach immediately puts the teacher in a position of a student because you cannot teach what you do not know. Every single person in this room is here because you want to learn. You're here because you want to learn something so you can teach someone, right? And I think in God's plan for discipleship, church leadership, mentorship, etc., the goal is that people who are students of us would learn how to be students like us. So today I'm going to talk about knowledge. Knowledge is what a student gains from learning. So just let's learn how best to understand the what so we can be wise in the how. I have four points. My first point is that knowledge starts with fear. Knowledge starts with fear. If you have your Bibles and I say if uh, rhetorically, um, do you? you? You do? Oh, okay. Seven of you have it. Great. Uh, no, nobody has it. Okay. For the seven, pr- turn to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. Proverbs chapter 1, or should I say click? That's probably better verbiage. Click to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7. The verse says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Have you ever met somebody that was smart and stupid all at the same time? Some of y'all in here, but praise God. Uh, (laughs) I know a few people personally, I ain't going to say their names, that are really intelligent, got degrees in all of that, full of facts, quick-witted. They know long division and algebra, all the stuff that we don't never use. They know it. But they do stuff that doesn't make any sense to me. It's like how you got a master's degree, and yet you didn't have the common sense to know that you shouldn't have went over that boy's house at 10 p.m. to watch Netflix. I, I don't understand. Or Hulu, whatever. I don't, I don't, I don't understand the disconnect and, and why your intelligence doesn't apply in particular areas in your life. That's because true knowledge doesn't start with what you know. True knowledge starts with who you know. Knowledge starts with fear. Depending on who you ask, leaving a legacy of learning might be communicated a couple ways. One way is someone who sees knowledge as merely having book smarts would spend a lot of time and energy with gathering and retaining information from books, from lectures, from podcasts. The men and the women they are leading would then follow them in this way and conclude that that is all that it means to gain knowledge. But I don't think that the writer of this proverb would leave that kind of legacy because he knows that knowledge without the presence of reverence only produces intelligent fools. The writer says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fear of God is not a set of training wheels that you can discard once you've acquired all that you need to know. The fear of God is the bike. Without it, you ain't going nowhere fast. The fear of God 
is not to be confused with terror or living in a state where you are always like God is big and he's going to kill me one day. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. But it is having the awareness that God is big and that God is holy and sees and knows everything and that whatever he wants to do, he can do. All that he is should inspire a reverence that is producing itself out into obedience. In Exodus 19, there is this really dramatic scene where God is giving his law to his people, Israel, in his own voice. They are standing at the base of Mount Sinai. When God arri arrives, there is thunder, there is lightning, and there are clouds with no rain. There is a trumpet blast that is heard that no one is actually playing. The mountain is wrapped in smoke because the text says that the Lord descended on it in fire. And then the mountain began to tremble. And as it did, the trumpet blast that, again, nobody was playing, began to get louder and louder. And then God spoke. The text says that God spoke in thunder. Then God communicated his law to Israel. Now understand this. The people of Israel at this time were about 1.2 million people. So God's voice is loud enough where 1.2 million people can hear him. If you were at the foot of this mountain with all of that going on, what would you feel? You'd feel fear. And that's exactly how Israel felt to the point that they told Moses, hey, uh, bro, uh, if we keep hearing God's voice, I think we're going to die. So can you go talk to him up there and just come back and tell us what he said and we'll do it. We promise. <laughs> we promise we will. Their experience of the holiness of God put a fear in them that motivated obedience. This is why the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom, because wisdom isn't just what you know, it's what you do, okay? If you don't fear God, then when you stand before him on that great day, what you know will not protect you from what he knows about you. So the fear of God guards you from believing that what's inside of your brain will save you from what's inside of your heart. People that fear God first, have a right perspective on knowledge, truth, life, money, people, relationships, alcohol, marijuana, because fearing God has given them the wisdom to know what to do and what not to do with all of it. If I want to leave a legacy of learning, then I need to do that by first leaving a legacy that is shaped by the fear of God. Point two, knowledge puffs up. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. This is fun. Y'all enjoying this? We learning together. Ain't God good? 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 1 through 3, it says, now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines, imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anybody loves God, he is known by God. In the Corinthian church and during that time in the world, offering, to, offering meat to or food to idols as worship was common. It was so rooted in the culture that a portion of meat offered to an idol could very well be the meat that, is in, that ends up to be uh, sold in marketplaces. For that reason, there was always the possibility that you as a Christian could end up eating meat that was offered to an idol. There were Christians on both sides of the debate. I like the fact that Christians have been arguing for a long time. There were Christians on both sides, those who thought that eating food to idols or offered to idols was wrong, and those who believed that it wasn't. Paul addresses this ethical issue by first speaking to knowledge. He says, this knowledge, obviously referring to something that is being discussed in Corinth or Corinth, this knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The folks on the side of the debate that said eating food offered to idols, that that was totally fine, 
were the kinds of Christians that know a whole lot but don't love nobody well. If they had a Twitter, they probably would have said something like, an idol is a creation, not the creator, in reference to Romans 1, and thus they are unable to, by virtue of their ontology, to be considered similar to the ancient of days who became flesh and dwelt among us. That's how they would talk. <laughs> they would be the theologians of our day, the people that posture themselves as smarter than everybody. Their assessment of how to understand these idols being no God of all was accurate. If you read verses 4 and 6, Paul affirms that what they were saying was true. The problem was that they thought themselves smarter than the Christians whose consciences could not give them peace about eating food offered to idols. Their knowledge was producing an intellectual superiority that was choking out their love and putting stumbling blocks in front of their brothers and sisters in Christ. In the pursuit of knowledge, especially for Christians who might, you know, enter into a seminary or a Bible college, this is relevant. Yeah. Knowledge will puff you up if you let it. Puffed up gives the image of inflation or being filled up with something, namely pride. And I think, I think it's easy to get puffed up by knowledge when you have stopped doing the work of comparing your knowledge or thinking of your knowledge in light of the knowledge of God and have started to compare your knowledge with the people that you can see. As soon as we take our eyes off God, i.e. stop fearing Him, the flesh will start to make us think that we are more valuable because of what we know. Knowledge then becomes an issue of identity and you know this when all of your conversations become debates. When preaching becomes a means of praise for all that you learn instead of an act of service. When being smart, when being smart or theologically sound becomes how you identify yourself, you misplace glory. And when people say, wow, you're so smart, or wow, that was so intelligent what you said, you confuse what they said with love. You think that made you valuable because you got praise. Paul tells the people of Corinth, yeah, you know some stuff, and this knowledge will puff you up and inflate you, and can't nobody do nothing with a balloon except look up at it. But God has not made you to be a prop. He has made your brain to communicate his love. Paul says that love builds up, speaking to this idea of an edifice, growing up into a temple where the Holy Spirit is. When you know some stuff then, how can you practice love? I have five ideas, four ideas, and I ain't going to expound on them. I think they're pretty plain. Number one, fear God by believing he resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. I think that gives us sobriety in our learning where we don't, we don't want to get beyond God's grace. We don't want to, I don't want to make God mad, you know what I'm saying? So I'm going to fear you because I know that you give grace to those who are low. Number two, walk in humility by acknowledging God's complete knowledge of everything and your limited knowledge of all things. Number three, realize that though you may be smarter than somebody, it doesn't make you better than anybody. When you attribute value to your intellectual capacity, you will naturally devalue those who you think are not as intellectual as you are. And so, realize that all of us are image bearers. Nobody is better than the next. And number four, put your identity in the reality that you are known by God. When being known by God matters more to you, you won't try to make yourself known by all that you know by other people. You are more than what you know. Number three, knowledge is practical. Knowledge is practical. Turn to Philippians chapter 4, verse 9. Paul says, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me Practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. When I was 19, I moved to L.A. for a season of my life, and I attended a church called uh, P4CM. And while I was there, I lived with the director of the women's ministry who discipled me. Funny thing is, I had been a Christian maybe a whole six months 
but I really thought I was wise. Like, I just, I just thought I was smart. And I think it's because I, at, prior to that, I was in a church context that exalted your gifts more than they exalted your character. And so I think because I was a good communicator, they assumed that I actually knew what I was talking about, but that's neither here nor there. So when I went to a church where somebody could see past the gifting and see the lack of wisdom and the immaturity that existed, it was heavy. It was hard. It was difficult. I remember the first week, I st- or the first two weeks I stayed with her, um, I used to get up and get on the, the computer to get on Facebook. Now, this is 2009. So that was before, like, you know, you could pull out your phone and get on stuff. So I would get on a whole desktop, like sit on the little swivelly chair and stuff. And so <laughs> I get on the desktop, and she got a post-it note that say, before you even open this computer, I need you to read John 1. And I'm like, first of all, how she know my schedule? Like, who? <laughs> She's clearly walking in the prophetic, because I don't understand. <laughs> but what my discipleship relationship was, is that she would make me read something, make me learn something, help me process through it, and then tell me to apply it. And when, there were, when it was misapplied or not applied, she would challenge me. Remember what we just read about John 1? Why aren't you showing that in what you just did today? Remember what we just read about uh, humility in Philippians 2? Why aren't you counting someone else as more significant than yourself? Where she was challenging me not to just gain all of this stuff, but to actually put it into practice. This is what Paul is saying here. Everything that you learn from me, practice it. Now, if you take his letter to the Philippians, just that letter, into account, Paul has told them a whole lot. I'm going to read three sentences that I think stand out in the first three chapters of Philippians. The first chapter, he says, to live with Christ and to die as gain. The second chapter, he says, Christ, who was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. The third chapter, he says, for this sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as, as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. I think all these texts are familiar to us. We probably got them tatted on our arm right now. We've learned them tweeted them, preached them, but we all know that it's easy to learn it and recite it than it is to actually live it. But clearly, Paul and God's aim in the Word of God is that it would flow out of us practically, as in what we learn should inform how we live. So, Let's take the sentence, deliver Christ into die as gain. Let's take it out of the theoretical and put it into the practical. How would we actually live out this scripture? What would that actually look like? Well, to live as Christ means that our lives would have Jesus all over. From the decisions we make to the spouses that we pick or don't pick, everything that makes up your life would be subject to the rule of Jesus Christ. But when he says to live as Christ, to die as gain, what does that die as gain? How does that actually look in my life? Well, if Christ has been your life, then the life after the next, you actually look forward to that because that's when you'll actually see Jesus. When Jesus isn't your life, you're afraid of his face because you don't know what he's going to say. But when Jesus is your life, when you know him and you know that he knows you, death is nothing but a good thing because you know now I can see the face of the one that I love. You get it? Now, how does that work itself out practically? Well, if death is gain, then you don't fear it. If you don't fear it, then you don't fear those who can kill the body. If you don't fear those who can kill the body, then you stop fearing people. What happens when you stop fearing people? You stop being afraid of offending people. When you're not afraid of offending people, you start telling the truth to everybody. Why? Because what's the most they can do? Kill you? (laughs) Imagine how bold you would be if you believed death was gain. This is how this scripture actually lives in your body. God's word is alive and God breathes and it is profitable, not just for knowing some stuff, but for training in righteousness. Meaning that your orthodoxy better have some orthopraxy or it's worth of nothing. You can tweet that and tag me in it. I think there are two things, moving from that place, I think there are two things that knowledge should do for us in our ministries practically. That is, they should help us love God more and love our neighbor. Jesus says that the law hinges on these two things. We have people in the world who know a lot of stuff, but their knowledge isn't isn't being used to help them love God more. 
for many intellectuals, atheists, college professors, scientists, what they've accumulated is an abundance of knowledge that actually makes them fools. Paul said it in Romans 1 when he said that these people claim to be wise, but they became fools because everyone who is born in sin and thus born with a darkening understanding, Romans 1 from birth, has uh, this, because of we're born in sin, our thinking bends away from truth. So irregardless of how much we know, when we don't know God, we'll most likely use whatever knowledge we've attained to actually suppress the truth of God. But for Christians, those whose minds are no longer set on the flesh, our knowledge of many things actually assist us in loving God. Consider this. Let me read you some facts. One, our galaxy contains over 1 billion, 100 billion stars. It's a whole lot. Who counts these things? The sun is over 100 times the diameter of the earth. If, if it were hollow, it could hold over 1 million earths. If a human being's DNA was uncoiled, it would stretch 10 billion miles from earth to Pluto and back. The brain contains 86 billion nerve cells joined by 100 trillion connections. This is more than the number of stars in the Milky Way. Scientists estimate that there are over 1 million species in the ocean, but also 95% of the ocean hasn't even been explored, meaning that in all of these centuries, all we know about the ocean is worth 5%. A man who was considered to be one of the smartest human beings in the world by the name of Stephen Hawking knew all of these facts and way more. This is how his knowledge informed his understanding of God. He was quoted by saying this, if we do discover a complete theory, it should in time be understandable and broad principle by everyone, not just a few scientists. Then we shall all philosophers, scientists, and just ordinary people be able to take part in the discussion of the question of why it is that we and the universe exist. If we find the answer to that, it would be the ultimate triumph of human reason, for then we would know the mind of God. Before we understand science, it is natural to believe that God created the universe. But now, science offers a more convincing explanation. What I meant by we would know the mind of God is, we would know everything that God would know if there was a God, which there isn't. He took that to mean all these facts, God couldn't possibly exist. But in contrast, those of us who might not be as smart as Stephen, but are more wise than Stephen, when we learn about how God has made the universe, the world and us, it doesn't lead us away from God, but if anything, it magnifies our praise. We are the ones that then say, when I look at the heavens and the work of your hands, the moon and the stars, which you, you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? My understanding of these scientific facts moves me to worship. Knowledge of the word is the primary way that our learning can lead us toward loving God more, but to a soft heart. When we learn about anything that he has made, we can grow in our love for God through it. The second thing that our knowledge should assist us in is our love for our neighbor. I spent a lot of time talking about the topic of sexuality, and as of late, I've been studying more about the history of uh, the queer community and LBGTQ uh, people. And I'm learning about how it wasn't, you know, how it was a, considered a mental illness to be gay until 1967, roughly. Um, that it was criminalized to be homosexual, that you can go to a jail for having public displays of affection for someone of the same sex. I'm learning about harassment and how far-reaching it has been of those who are sexual minorities. I'm learning about the unequal treatment that is still present in people trying to get jobs or can't retain their jobs or all of this stuff. And it's, what's doing, what it's doing to me is that learning about the world of those who would be considered sexual minorities is that it's making me flesh out and what way can I, as a Christian, love a community of people who have been treated historically as less than? It's making me think about how does the gospel speak not only to their being born after Adam, but how does the gospel speak to them as image bearers who haven't been treated as such? My knowledge of their history and their present tensions give me empathy. With empathy and wisdom, comes ministry that is both theologically true, but also gracious and kind. Christians should not just be known for their gift of preaching at people. We should be known by our love of people. But, but 
It makes sense. It makes sense why it's so common that that's not, that the latter is not the, the general idea of Christians because if knowledge puffs up, then I expect a self-centered person to not care about learning something that would actually make them a better servant. But love, love will lead you to grow on your understanding of your neighbor so that you can provide specific application to their circumstance in a way that apathy would never allow. Some of us don't study certain stuff because we don't care about the people that it's talking about. So when you care, you want to get in their world. You want to understand their language. You want to understand where they're from. You want to understand why they think the way that they do so that you can better and be better informed about what you say when you talk about Jesus to these people. So who in your life has God given you proximity to? Black people? Then watch Martin. What, what, what you doing? A different world, you know. Fox News ain't going to help you out and understand the black people. Am I right? The black people say yeah. I'll just say it. Who's in your, is it, is it immigrants? Is it rich people? Is it low-income people? Single mothers, college students, atheists, agnostics. Learn about the folks that God has given you influence on ministry with. Ask them questions. Read books about their history, their world, their systems of belief. Don't assume that you know them because you watched a movie. But posture yourself as a learner and flesh out what you learned about your neighbor with what you know about God's Word. And then your ministry will be way more thoughtful and incredibly helpful. We should all want to leave a legacy of not just knowing good things, but actually doing good stuff. Point number four, and this is my last one. Knowledge and folly meet at the cross. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, looking at verse 20 through 24, says, Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Jesus was polarizing at best. People didn't know what to do with him. Was he God? Was he possessed? Did he come from Galilee, Bethlehem? Why he healing people on the Sabbath? How is he able to answer questions and he ain't even 40 yet? Why he telling us to eat his flesh and drink his blood? That's a little strange. Why they talking about finna stone this lady and he over here writing in the, in the dust? That don't make sense. Jesus' ministry was constantly questioned because he didn't make sense. So imagine how both Jews and Greeks felt when Paul told them that eternal life was found in the dude that confused them. They naturally asked, so... You're telling us to believe in the guy who Pilate delivered over to the powers that be to be crucified, the, the Jewish dude who hung on the cross naked for hours on end saying that he was God, but he didn't even rescue himself. You're saying that he's God and supposed to be worshiped and that I can live forever and go to heaven if I believe in him. That sounds foolish to everybody that is perishing. One reason it sounds foolish, foolish is because when our understanding is darkened, in a real way, sin has messed up our minds where we don't think right. And so what happens is it sounds foolish because in a real way, we think we have more wisdom than God does. Why do you think there are so many rejections to, the, to having faith in God? People resist the gospel for very logical reasons. It's not just feelings that people are dependent upon. Even in Genesis 3, Eve put the tree into categories. I think that this is desire to make one wise. This looks delightful to the sight. Man, this looks good for food. She had a logical reason for her unbelief. The problem 
is that these people who are coming to logical conclusions are using their minds to, uh, using their minds in a way that God has not intended them for, to, for them to have is the problem that they believe that their conclusions are right, even if it's unbiblical. For example, Someone might say, I think that there are many ways to God, many paths to God. It doesn't make sense that God would be so limited in making salvation available only through Jesus Christ. I believe that my God is kind, that my God is gracious, and so that he would allow me to find him however and through whoever. Have you heard that before? That kind of person has esteemed their wisdom has esteemed their wisdom of how somebody could have, get access to God over and above how God has actually said you can get access to him. To them, it seems foolish that Jesus is the only door that they can walk to, to walk through to have a relationship with the Father. Most of the arguments and the critiques that we are hearing about the Word of God and the person of God are coming out of the mouth of folk that really think they know better than he does. That is why people define love on their own terms and not his, because they think they know what love is over and above what God says. That is why people think that self-autonomy is true freedom and submission to God is cruel. They don't believe God when, they, when he says, follow me and you will have eternal life. They think eternal life is here, joy is here, satisfaction is here, not there. That is why you have people who believe that forgiveness is an unwise thing and, a, and, and that forgiveness or that vengeance is a, a better thing or a better thing to do. Again, this is why in Romans 1, Paul says that when people don't honor God for who he is, namely smarter than everybody, they become futile in their thinking. And it's in this foolishness that they actually think they're wise. You know that you are a fool. The moment you think your way is better than God's, you didn't even make the world. <laughs> like literally, the most you've made is a tweet, uh, some origami, some food. He made everything from a word. And how could you possibly think the one that created your brain is an infinitely beyond it? His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. God is indescribably intelligent. Our unbelief is what is being disguised as wisdom. So much so that we are over here thinking that sin makes more sense than obedience. Ain't that crazy? And it's because the world's wisdom is not real wisdom that it cannot lead anyone towards God, but only away from him. That's what Paul is saying in verse 21. He says, for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. Our thoughts are so rooted in our own foolishness before Christ that we will always end up thinking that everything else is better than God. That's what idolatry is. I have made a conclusion about creation and said that this is better than the created one. God, because we are naturally, or because this, this mindset is naturally our default, we never find ourselves at the foot of the cross unless God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, humbles us to get us there. God determined that the way he would humble folks is by placing his son, Jesus, God in the flesh on the cross. The crucifixion or the cross being a device that only criminals hung from. No one who is supposedly sinless should be up on that thing, but that God did it anyway. And not only that, apparently, this crucifixion was an act of love. Someone might say, I never let my child suffer in that way. But again, that would be presuming that you are more charitable to your children than God would be to his son. This son, bloody and broken and stretched wide because he, he died for us because God loved the world. Again, doesn't make sense. How does the death of one man make up for the sins of the whole world? Shouldn't we need many sons? Shouldn't we need many sacrifices? Well, in the same way that one man brought sin into the whole world, one man brought the free gift of God's grace into the whole world. So that, so that when they look upon him, they will not have to die the way he did. Just because it don't make sense don't mean it ain't true. And that's why salvation comes by grace through faith. Your intelligence didn't bring you to God, his kindness did. And when he showed up and brought light to your darkened understanding, you saw that Jesus was the wise one the whole time. 
That's where our faith is. Our faith is saying God is, he's right and accurate in all that he said. So even in our teaching, the people that God has placed in our lives, our, in our leadership, in our discipleship, to give people Jesus is to give them access to true knowledge. It's easy to get distracted and think that you have to move on to more intellectual topics to make people wiser. But we preach, you okay? <laughs> All right, I don't want nobody falling now. Uh, <laughs> it was so loud, I'm like, it has to be some danger happening here. <laughs> Something is, is going wrong. Um, it's easy to think that you have to provide these lofty theological things for people to be wise. And, you, and in the, I think in an attempt to do that, some people miss the beauty of the gospel. The thing is, we preach Christ crucified because even if he is a stumbling block to some people, even if he is seen as dumb to other people, to those who are called, he is the power of God and the wisdom of God. To see and know and learn about Jesus will make you the wisest person in the room. On that cross, God used what some people would consider foolish to make way for us to be able to know our Savior. Only a really smart God could think of something like that. May we lead in the way that he does. Let's pray. God, you said that if we ask for wisdom, you would supply it. So we ask for it. We ask that you would give us wisdom, wisdom from your word, wisdom from your people, wisdom from your Holy Spirit. I pray, God, that you would make us teachable people. I know for me, my growth has been stunted when I've concluded I know more than everybody. And so I pray, God, that you would humble me where I would listen to people who haven't even been sent. I would listen to people that I deem unintellectual, God. But I would see that you even spoke through donkeys. You speak through anybody to show us who you are. I pray that you would help us, lead us, guide us. In Jesus' name, amen.